Hello, I'm Michael Burke. Welcome to a brand new series of Royal Recipes. This time, we're at Western Burt House, formerly a grand country house, now a boarding school, which has played host to royal visitors for over a hundred years. In this series, we're delving even further back in time to reveal over 600 years of royal food heritage. You play Anne Boleyn, <laughs> and I will play Henry VIII. And we've been busy unlocking the secrets of Britain's great food archives, discovering rare and unseen recipes that have been royal favourites through the ages. From the earliest royal cookbook in 1390... It's so precious, so special, that I'm not allowed to touch it. ..to Tudor treats from the court of Henry VIII. I can't wait for this. <laughs> One, two, three. We'll be exploring the great culinary traditions enjoyed by the royal family, from the grand to the groundbreaking, as well as the surprisingly simple. I did think that was going to be a disaster. Woo! <laughs> 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 as we hear from a host of royal chefs. Prince Philip would walk past or pop his head in and say, what's for dinner, what are we having? Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, it's not just a normal kitchen. And meet the people who provide for the royal table. It's OK for the Queen, it's OK for everyone. Welcome to Royal Recipes. We'll be sampling party food in the programme today. The royals know how to throw a good shindig, and we're going to be attending some of history's finest royal bashes. This time on Royal Recipes... Yeehaw! Yeah! <laughs> Paul Ainsworth gives us a flavour of a Buckingham Palace garden party. It's gold leaf. It's gold leaf. Good gracious. It just makes it decadent. I'm really decadent. We visit a famous party venue that celebrated years of royal patronage. Windsor Romance. Windsor Romance. That's quite an evocative name. It's very evocative. What does it commemorate? It commemorates the wedding of Prince Charles and the then Lady Diana Spencer. And we rustle up a childhood party favourite of William and Harry's. When the boys were very little, they loved to come in and bake cookies and cakes although the kitchen was always in quite a mess by the time we'd finished. I'm here in the Royal Recipes kitchen with Michelin-starred chef Paul Ainsworth. I know this is going to be good, but what <laughs> is it this time? We are going to do a smoked salmon Morecambe Bay shrimp timbal. What's yeah. timbal? So timbal basically is a, is a Spanish word for kettle drum. Ah. So that's exactly what this is, like a, a drum-type mould. Now, this was the dish served at the Queen's 80th birthday absolutely. party. Yes. Staged by Prince Charles. And do you know what? I absolutely love flavours yeah. like this. Do you like smoked salmon? I love smoked salmon. Right, if you absolutely grab a piece, we're, yeah, both gonna, we go. we're both going to wait. So we're just going to... All we want is a little bit up really to the side there. Really thinly cut, isn't it? Really thinly cut. No, you, you do what you're going to do, oh, one. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> I put a bit... You're not I, getting off that lightly. I know, I know. <laughs> Hang on, here we go. D down in there. That's it. Just make sure it's right into the sides and the bottom. So then you've got all of the, ed all of the edges covered. Actually, so, I think mine's a bit of a masterpiece. I would not expect anything less. So this was the first course, obviously, at this wonderful birthday party. Cute yeah. palace, it was. They had the London Chamber Orchestra there playing Handel's Water Music. Marvellous. We're going to move that and yep. just put that over to the side yep. with you. There we and go. Now our next job, yep. we've got some white wine vinegar, yep. pinch of sugar, yep. pinch of salt in there like so. Yep. Swirling it around, and that's going to dissolve in there. Okay. Now we move on to the filling. So I'm just going to take this bowl yep. and put that on your board. OK. I'm going to dice this. Now, this is royal fillet of salmon. It's basically a nice steak. And why the chunk? Because we want to dice, and what we're going to do is add texture. We're going to add ah. a nice dice, like about the size of our fingernail, like those shrimps. You've got cream cheese and yep. sour cream. If yep. you add that in there, I'm going to start dicing. OK. So okay. I just throw it in? Throw it in. Now, oh. these are Morecambe Bay shrimps. Morecambe Bay shrimps. There you go. There we go. Thanks. 
Are they particularly special? What's special they about Morgan Bay? Very, then? They are very, very nice. They're just a beautiful salty shrimp. They're really meaty, Michael. They're almost. Do you, do you know what? When you eat them, they almost squeak in your mouth. What's the difference between a shrimp and a prawn? I've never worked it out. I think a lot of people will put it down to size. Do I just mix this up? That's in it. Some just way? mix that in there. You've got both in. Now do some lemon zest in there for me, please, Michael. Okay. If you, uh, can remember how to do that. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> no, no. Less of the sarcasm. How so much... If I can just get in your way there. Yeah. How much lemon zest? There. About that. Okay. That's it. Absolutely perfect. Fingers untouched. Look at that. Absolutely. Still no, in one piece. I know. No. You, have, you haven't forgotten a thing, have you? <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to chop some chives. So you oh. can see these flavours really working nice. You've got acidity coming from the creme fraiche and the sour cream. Mm. You've got that lovely meatiness coming from the shrimp, smokiness from the salmon, yeah. lovely lemon zest. And by doing it on a fine zester like that, you're creating oils from the lemon. And Look at that lovely chop. So just a really light onion flavour, like, almost like spring yep. onions. OK. Lovely. Right. Now, we're going to take our moulds. Yep. Bring them up here like so. Yep. And we're just going to spoon in that lovely mixture. Ready? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Like so. Also, what you get from the creme fraiche and the sour cream is a lovely seasoning. And remember as well, you've got saltiness coming from the salmon mm. and the shrimps. What a day it must have been, her 80th birthday party. Do you know, she had 20,000 birthday cards. 20,000? Yeah. You've got to have a big mantelpiece for that lot, haven't you? Now, you can help me again. Yep. And all we're going to do is just fold over oh, yeah. like this. OK? And then push down. Yeah, just be careful of the cling film, OK? Yeah. Now, same again, right over. You make it into a parcel. That's it. Now, the important thing, though, is, is push it down, because what you want to do is create a little bit of pressure. Otherwise, it will just be a bit floppy in the middle. Got it. Right, now, look how good these are looking. A real dinner party kind of spectacle. Are, now. Yep. What I would like you to do is put those in the fridge. Okay. And do you know what? Our minimum, but it doesn't matter if you didn't use them till the next day, right. just as long as they set. And nice. that set? Absolutely. OK. While you're going to the fridge, I'm going to get on with chopping some okay. cucumber for our pickle. I'll be back in seconds. OK. I feel like a royal footman. Where do you want about you? On you, him? you always come back with nice presents. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love cucumber. What we're going to do, Michael, is pickle it and put some chopped dill through it, OK? So, just like so. Now, why do you pick, pickle it? A bit, bit of the sharpness? Yeah, just yeah. give sharpness, because you've got the fattiness coming from the mm. salmon. There's quite a mm. lot of richness in that yeah. dish. Yeah, yeah. Right, so if you just grab me that bowl over there, please. It's interesting how often salmon figures on the menus for the Queen. It must be her, one of her favourite dishes. Now that's Hebridean see how that's dissolved. Oh yeah, yeah. We pour yeah. that in there like so. Yep. Okay. We can put a little bit more cucumber in there, and straight away, that pickle is just going to absorb straight into that cucumber. But pickling takes a long time, doesn't it? Not with something like cucumber, because it's such a soft vegetable, yeah. it's penetrating in there straight away. But yeah. you could you could eat that after a few hours. You could eat that uh, in you know a few days. Dill. Just rub your fingers, smell that. Oh, I say. Absolutely. It's Again, overpowering, isn't it? And these are all classic flavours, and you can see why the royals, you know, they love their classic dishes. Yeah. Food that's but, not fast around simple. with. It's, it's simple. simple. Yeah. And you know what, Michael, for me, it's proper, proper food. I'm just going to add a pinch of rock salt. Yeah. And now we're going to plate up. OK. Oh, that looks absolutely perfect, doesn't it? I'd say, shape. I'd say that looks proper regal. Proper regal, you? I'd say. Proper regal. <laughs> Here we go. Right, there, do you want that now? And now just simple. I think that must have been one of the ones I did, actually. I think it, it yeah. is the one you did. It, you know, it, it is, it is the one the you did. It's the perfection that Absolutely. Shows. Take some more of those gorgeous shrimps, put some of those on the top yep. and around the plate. A little bit of cress, because it's royal and you have to have cress, don't you? Yeah. And I'm just going to take a little bit of that olive oil, giving us a nice pepperiness. Ah. And that there, just simply, salmon, Morecambe Bay shrimp timbal, pickled cucumber and some cress. Birthday Mate. party for a queen. Put it there. Now, how are you going to get I'm going to cut this? it like a cake. Is it going to be that solid to be able That's to do like, that? It's not going to splurge. Do you remember when we were talking about packing it in yeah, yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that? So I'm just going to cut you a nice little well, When you said wedge. packing it in, I thought you were going to retire, Paul, <laughs> on all the money you make in that <laughs> restaurant of yours. <laughs> There we go. Now, there you go. And let me just grab you a spoon. Yes. Make sure you get it with a bit of that pickled cucumber. I, I shall. Absolutely. You've just got acidity, richness, lovely texture. Hang on. 
Mm. That is the business, isn't it? Mm. And that is really perfect. I absolutely, genuinely love that. Fantastic. It's look, if you're happy, I'm happy. <laughs> Simple and delicate, yet bursting with richness and flavour. A fittingly elegant dish for a royal birthday dinner. Catering for a regal do like a queen's birthday takes a great deal of thought and planning. And there's one royal supplier who's turned entertaining into a fine art. Fortnum and Mason. Known as the Queen's Grocers, its name conjures regal connections that have kept the central London store in the luxury food business for over 300 years. And it's an emporium that offers a special insight into what you might be served if you were invited to a grand Buckingham Palace party. In the food hall, they make blinis. A perennial favourite with the royals, these small, delicate pancakes form the base of many luxurious canapes. Andrew Kavanagh is head of fresh food and hospitality. We produce between 1,000 a day and 1,200 a day. So the uh, most ubiquitous topping for a blini is um, smoked salmon and creme fraiche. Salmon blinis were among 5,000 canapes served at the reception hosted by the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh at Buckingham Palace to launch the UK-India Year of Culture in 2017. So a very light scraping of creme fraiche, small slice of hand-carved smoked salmon, and then just a small spoon of caviar, just as a finishing touch. So with just a few simple ingredients, it's incredible what can be turned into something so elegant to, to serve at a party that um, will wow everybody. The store was founded on Royal Connections back in 1707, when Hugh Mason and William Fortnum opened a small shop in Duke Street, Mayfair. Dr Andrea Tanner, the company archivist, tells us more about their humble beginnings. William was a footman at the court of Queen Anne in St James's, and Hugh was his landlord. One of the perks of William's job was that he got to empty the candlesticks of the half-burnt candles every night in the palace, and he would take them home and melt them down and put new wicks in them and bring them back and sell them to the ladies of the court. This enterprise was so successful that he and Hugh decided they were going to open up a shop, initially selling candles, but very soon selling very exotic things like tea from far-flung China. The shop was very successful, by 1756, they had an entrance in Piccadilly, but the Fortnum family didn't give up their day job. They continued to work at the palace. They continued to be royal servants. The royal connection was extremely important at the beginning, partly because it was a very good source of customers. The shop has famously supplied food to kings and queens over the centuries, but it also produces memorabilia to mark significant royal events. One of our specialities was to provide people with wonderful ready-made things to celebrate royal occasions. This is our coronation commentary for 1937. This is for George VI. And we could supply you with everything you wanted, the things to drink, the things to eat, even down to liveried servants and your uh, cutlery and glasses. So this was to enable people to join in the celebrations and perhaps to eat a little bit of what the royal family themselves were enjoying. Today, the shop has two royal warrants, one from Her Majesty the Queen and one from His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. And we've been very fortunate in that we've had royal warrants from their forebears, Queen Victoria, all of her children, her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, including Queen Maud of Norway. The store's successful relationship with the royal family is not just down to a regal love of its food, but also to its tact and diplomacy. People frequently ask, well, what does the Queen buy? And we can't say. Discretion is part of our makeup. So although I can't say what current members of the royal family buy from the store, there's quite a nice story about the Duke of Windsor, the ex-King Edward VIII. 
course he abdicated before his coronation and went over to France uh, to get ready to marry Mrs. Wallace Simpson. And while he was waiting at the Chateau de Condé, the shop would fly in his provisions every single day. And one of the things that he was most keen to have were kippers, because that's what he liked to have for his breakfast. Unsurprisingly, in 2012, the store pulled out all the stops to celebrate the Queen's Jubilee in style. We produced 60 products. One of the most popular was a tin of biscuits that played God Save the Queen. Sticking with age-old traditions is hugely important to our royals, but that doesn't mean tucking into the same tried and tested dishes every time they throw a party. These days, the royals, the young ones especially, seem to have a very varied taste in food. It's not just about the finer things in life. Talking of which, Paul, what are you cooking today? We are cooking today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Memphis ribs. As in Memphis, Tennessee? Memphis, Tennessee, America, yes. And pork ribs? Pork ribs, absolutely. Brilliant for barbecuing, brilliant for slow cooking. And supposed to be a favourite of uh, the young princes, particularly Prince William and, and Harry, yeah. uh, according to the papers, anyway. Yeah. What we do know is they went to a friend's wedding in Memphis, Tennessee, yeah. and they went out to a rather famous, or famous for Memphis, uh, restaurant called The Rendezvous, and they had pork spare ribs and, according to the papers, absolutely loved them. So what did they like? In Memphis, you've got that kind of sweet, salt and that spice. So mm. they go really well together. With American pit cooking, mm. you have a dry rub. Yeah. And what we've got here is salt, demerara sugar, paprika and some pepper. That's going to be a tangy rub, isn't it? But yeah, but remember, quite a lot of surface area to cover. And we've got yeah. two sets of ribs there. Right? Yeah. What sort of effect are you what trying to get? What you're aiming for is really deep kind of caramelisation. You cut into it and because of the slow, smoky cooking, the fat is just beautifully dispersed through the meat. It's juicy. It's it is delicious way of cooking. Only if you get it right. Only if you get it right, I mean, absolutely. What You're are the pitfalls? Not getting your heat right, mm. having your temperature too hot, mm. but also as well, smoke is lovely, but it can be very overpowering yeah. and very acrid. You're really putting a lot on yeah. there, aren't you? OK, remember, we've got to save some for the bottom, right? And the reason we really pad it in is because we really want that seasoning to get straight in there. The Americans are really right. big into barbecuing, aren't they? Huge. If you want to come and have a look over yep, here, yep, and I'm no. going to talk to you about this. That is cherry wood. Yeah. Now, yeah. there's all sorts of different woods. Because we're going long and slow, we want our ribs to get that smoke over time, not straight away. So that's why we leave the wood nice and chunky. You might think, oh, there's no, not a lot of sizzle and stuff. Remember, we're yeah. slow cooking. Yeah, yeah, we're not yeah, caramelising yeah. like a steak. This isn't my kind of barbecue. Normally, there'd be flames that would yeah. be... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Everything would be black be on the outside, water on it. in the middle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These little containers, you fill them with water. So we've got two over this side, over the main heat source. The water is to kind of make the heat circulate, so indirect cooking. It's basically creating an oven, because if you just had the heat underneath, you would yeah. just be coming from the bottom, yeah. there'd be nothing cooking the top, yeah. and then you wouldn't have that lovely round heat. All right? This is science <laughs> at work. Well, you see, I'm not just a pretty face. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> right, next. I'm going to teach you all now about the mop. The mop? The mop, all right? What's a mop? Have you seen well, them when they've you've seen them when they've got the big pits and they're basting the meat or yeah, like yeah. at home if you're yeah. basting meat? Yeah. That's what that is, okay? Yeah. Now, that would be generally what people would use. Yep, okay? yep, yep, to all base right? the thing. Base yep. thing. I'm gonna use rosemary. Oh, all right? Okay. Why not? That tastes of nothing, it's hairy, it's bland. Yeah, okay. So we're gonna make now our mop. our basting mop mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in here I've got apple juice, mm -hmm. more paprika, demerara sugar. And then we've got some vegetable oil. Now, the way you want to do this is every every half an hour, mm. you want to be lifting that lid, yeah. basting, turning them over. That's the important thing with barbecuing as well, with any forms of meat for me. Keep turning. So we've got our paprika, our sugar, mm -hmm. our apple juice and our veg oil, mm -hmm. but it would not be a mop without a bit of Tennessee sipping whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Good glug of bourbon, yep. all right? Like a lot of American things, it's, it's slightly sweeter, isn't it? Slightly it's a sweeter, sweeter kind yeah. of whiskey. It's a sweeter kind of uh, barbecue all, all over, yeah. really. 
Okay. Now we go straight in like that. Look yep. at that. Lovely. Using okay. your... Would you hold the lid for me, Michael? I would. Is that OK? Yeah. OK. Y using your improvised brush. My improvised brush. Now, watch as we go on like that. Now, can you hear the juices just running off? Yep. But as as time goes on, that will start to caramelise on the meat. So it mm. just becomes delicious. So it's long and slow. So do that every half an hour. OK. So we go lid back Pop on. Pop this on. Yep. Now, really simple. And this is such a great meal to make at home in the summer as well, and not expensive at all. So you've got those beautiful slow cooking ribs, and we're simply going to serve it with slaw. Before we do, slow cooking, how long? For me, that would be about four hours. OK. And again, a nice rest. Now, what okay. are you doing here? So here, white cabbage, red cabbage. Mm -hmm. Just really simple. Some creme fraiche, good seasoning, vinegar, lovely crunchy vegetable, done. Yeah. No yeah. messing yeah. around. Yeah. Absolutely delicious. All the complexities so, in the meat, eh? A good, absolutely. A good seasoning. Yep. Then we're just going to, with your hands, get right in there, mix around. Now, what the vinegar's doing is starting to just slowly cure the cabbage, mm -hmm. OK? Start to cook it, and the salt. This is the perfect accompaniment, is it? It is, it is. Mm. Something like this lovely crunchy vegetable, that yeah. lovely acid from the vinegar, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Creme fraiche. Mm -hmm. I love the it's, stuff. It's lovely, creme oh, fraiche. Oh, I love isn't it. it. I love it. Without so just... too much richness. No. So, tell you what, if you could just I'll slowly that. mix that in for me, OK? OK. Until it basically looks like coleslaw. I'm going to go get our ribs. OK. All right? The fashion for spare ribs has been around quite a long time, hasn't it? Because uh, I think the reason the papers reckon the young princes like this sort of thing so much is that Princess Diana, when she was alive, used to take the young princes out in London. To eat out in, oh, with spare ribs that, and things. Yeah. 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 It's a long is, time ago now, isn't it? I mean, look at those. Oh, wow. It really is delicious comfort food. And there is something so brilliant about cooking like this. I think there's a real sense of satisfaction. Yeah. You know when you're doing slow cooking? Yeah. Like that. OK? Look oh, at there's those. a Look at them. <laughs> Absolutely delicious. I see what delicious. you mean about it caramelising. Have a smell. Just have <laughs> right, a smell. Okay. You, you, can you smell the wood? Oh, yeah. And the yeah. smell is beautiful, yeah. isn't it? So all of that flavour, but yeah. long and slow. Just at the end there, yeah. after about four hours, just take them off, wrap them in tin foil, mm. and you can even put them right over the other side where there's not much heat, yeah. and just let them sit there. Even this needs resting. And here we go, plating up time. Absolutely. You've got cherry wood in there. I, I had an American friend who used to swear by hickory chips. Absolutely. And, and does it make a difference? It does. And we've used large pieces of wood because we're doing long and slow. Yeah. If I was doing something like a chicken, I'd use something like a, a like a maple wood. You can almost look at what kind of meat you're cooking mm. and then kind of pick up the flavour characteristics that might be coming from that wood that you might think, well, that would go lovely with pork, or mm. that would go lovely with chicken. So now we're just going to take some of that gorgeous coleslaw, mm -hmm. like that, and this is real food with your hands, Michael. Real I was going to say, proper, you're in proper, there with the coleslaw. Proper, look at that. You've got to eat the Course spare ribs yeah. with your hands, haven't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Want to dig in? <laughs> right, let me get you one. Ready? Yep. Just watch how these will peel away like that. There, there you go. go. <laughs> it's hot. It's hot. Come on, it's not. It is. There we go. Mmm. Oh. Have a bit of the coleslaw with it as well. Oh, OK, hang on. Go for it. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's real food for <laughs> food. <laughs> hang on a second. Mm. Got some on your nose. <laughs> All right. All right, hang on. Oh. That's good, isn't it? Yeehaw! Yeah. <laughs> Yo. Kind of makes you proud, don't Yo. it? Mmm. <laughs> God bless America. God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> Tasty, informal party grub. Just as popular with our young royals as it is with everyone else. The coronation of Elizabeth II marked a return to the good times, following a period of austerity during and after the Second World War. It was an excuse for parties across the land. One of them was held at a particularly glamorous West End venue. A London landmark, the Savoy is renowned for throwing some of the glitziest shindigs in town, particularly royal ones. Dr Matt Green met the hotel's archivist, Susan Scott, to get a glimpse behind the scenes at one of its biggest bashes, a party to celebrate the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. Wow, well, well, it's a spectacular room, 1953. There are coronation balls pretty much all over the country. But what was so significant about the one that was held here? 
there had been a very good relationship between the royal family and the Savoy for many decades. And lots of quite significant events had actually happened here. Mm. So mm. it would have been odd if they hadn't wanted to do something quite significant. And I think for the first time in the hotel's history that I can think of, Every public room was pressed into service for this ball. Every single room, all at the same time. So it's on a monumental uh, scale. For our point of view, absolutely, yes, it was. A party on this scale would have needed meticulous planning to be the epitome of glamour and sophistication. And it called for a menu to match. So what have we here? This is actually the menu. And as you can see, it was in the form of a scroll. Le consommé riche Albion. The Salad Princess. It's not necessarily anything particularly exotic. No. But just with nice French names. It makes it sound very glamorous. Indeed, yeah. Who would be responsible for cooking all this? Well, our major chef was Monsieur La Planche. This would probably be one of the highlights of his career because it wasn't simply creating a coronation menu. It was creating a a menu that could be fed to, I think, over a thousand people. So over a thousand least. people sitting down. Absolutely. Each guest paid 12 guineas for a ticket. It doesn't sound much, but when you consider the average weekly wage was just over five pounds, only people with very deep pockets could afford it. It's the equivalent of 260 pounds today. You can spot a few famous faces in these pictures. Down here is the actor John Mills, and he's actually sitting next to Richard Attenborough's wife. Oh, and this yes, is, who's this? This is, I think it's the Lone Wob of Baha Walpur. Um, and he's wearing a very fine outfit, which is what he'd actually worn to the coronation itself earlier in the day. Oh, wow. And there were people here, his part of the Japanese delegation, who came straight from the coronation to celebrate afterwards. The Savoy has always attracted the world's rich and famous, including five generations of the British royal family. Before her coronation, the young Princess Elizabeth and her sister Margaret were regulars during cocktail hour at the hotel's famous watering hole. Shall we? Let's go. Okay. The American bar here was put on the map in 1920, when Harry Craddock, a new head barman, made exciting concoctions that drew large crowds of bright young things. Harry Craddock's successor in 1954 was his protege, Joe Gilmore, a favourite with the royals. Did he create anything exciting or notable for royal occasions? Actually, he did several royal cocktails. There's all sorts of events to be memorialised in cocktail form. Sure. And so that is a tradition that has continued with bartenders ever since. And this is one of them. It's called Windsor Romance. Windsor Romance? Windsor Romance. That's quite an evocative name. It's very evocative. What does it commemorate? It commemorates the wedding of Prince Charles and the then Lady Diana Spencer. And that's going to be demonstrated here by our barman, Dominic. Great. This is a bit of a favourite of mine, actually, and it uses some lemon juice and a touch of an almond syrup as well. Nice, plentiful amount of gin. Oh, it smells lovely. It does, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, magnificent. <laughs> okay, so, thinking of Charles and Diana, Mm, that is actually very much my kind of drink. The royal family's long association with the hotel continues, whether for private parties or a quiet lunch, and the younger generation are just as likely to drop in for a cocktail as their forebears. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Cocktail time, Paul. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, nobody knows what Good the times. word cocktail comes from, you know. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some say it's like, you know, because they, it's very colourful, aren't they, cocktails? They like, are. like a rooster's tail. Yes. But others say it comes from uh, the Spanish cola de gallo, which apparently is a kind of root uh, that looks like a rooster's tail that they, yeah. that they use to, um, to stir drinks with. That right, could be okay. cocktail. What's yeah. your favourite? Just recently, someone made me a Tom Collins, and huh? I absolutely loved it, because I quite like them simple. I quite like oh, a margarita, tequila like a margarita? with the salt around the top. Yeah, yeah. As far as the royals are concerned, Prince Charles apparently likes a half-and-half half martini, half gin, yeah. half dry vermouth. Yes. Which sounds as if it'd knock your head off to me. Camilla and Prince Edward like a, a gin and tonic, 
Prince William likes lager. Yes. When um, William and Kate got married, they had a cocktail that was passion fruit, raspberry liqueur, vodka and champagne. How's that? That sounds nice. Perhaps I might try that when we yeah. finish. Yeah, I'm going to have one of these. <laughs> Down through the years, generations of royals have thrown extravagant parties. But not every celebration has been a lavish, formal affair. Carolyn Robb was chef to the Prince and Princess of Wales for 13 years, from 1989. But before that, she worked for the Queen's cousin. And one day, some important visitors came for tea. Today I'm making some little chocolate mouse cupcakes. They hold a very special place in my heart as they're the first thing that I ever made for Prince William and Prince Harry. First time I made these was before I was actually cooking for the family. At that time I was cooking for the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester and they came for afternoon tea. Today I've got two little assistants, my daughters Lucy and Mandy. First I'm going to sieve together <coughs> some self-raising flour and two tablespoons of cocoa powder. I think it's um, really lovely to start cooking with children from a very young age. It inspires them to be creative, and it's just great fun. <laughs> and then I'm going to add some golden caster sugar as well, which can also go through the sieve. Lucy, you're going to pop that in? All of it. All of it, yep. That's it. Then we're going to rub it through the sieve. Well done. That's it. Right. That's done. Now we're going to add in some butter. It's really important to have the butter nice and soft. Um, we're making it by hand, so we want it to be nice and easy to mix. That's it. And the last thing we're going to do is break two eggs into that. Good. Well done. Pour that into the bowl. And you want to wipe your hands? Let's wipe that on there. And the last thing we're going to add is a teaspoon of vanilla. I like to use, this is a vanilla bean paste. It has a lovely, strong vanilla flavor. So this is what I always use. And now we're going to mix. And very often, the worst thing you can do to a cake is overmix it. And to have a turn, it's quite stiff. Depending on how thick the mixture is, sometimes at the very end I add in just a little splash of milk. So that's what I'm going to do now. Andy, can you put a little bit of that? About half of what's in there. Perfect. We used to make cupcakes for special occasions and um, they always had a very special birthday cake of their choice, but we always had great fun making them. Right, I think that's ready. Now we can pop it into the tin. Right, so we're going to put a spoonful in each one. The filled cases are popped in the oven at 180 degrees Celsius for 12 minutes. Carolyn worked for Charles and Diana for over a decade and still cherishes many happy memories from that time. One very special time of year in the royal household was Christmas time, and I always really looked forward to receiving the royal household Christmas card. I have a very special one here sent to me by the Prince and Princess of Wales with a wonderful photo of Prince William and Harry when they were still very small. While the cakes are cooking, Carolyn makes the glaze by first melting the chocolate. What are you doing? That's looking good now, isn't it? It's smelling delicious. And then adding some butter put the butter in to make it look nice and shiny. Um, when the boys were very little, they loved to come in and bake cookies and cakes and things. Princes were always very well behaved in the kitchen. We had lots of fun, but they were always very well behaved, extremely polite, but great fun to have. Right, I think that's good now. Now we're just going to leave that on the side for a moment, just to thicken up very slightly. Once the cooked cakes have cooled, all that's left is to transform them into mice. We're going to stick a marshmallow onto the top of each one using some of this chocolate. A nice marshmallow onto it in the centre. That's it. 
Mandy, you going to do it? This one, good girl. Just check that these are all firmly stuck onto the top of the cake. Then the next bit, I think I'll do. This part of the process where you spread the chocolate onto the top can be quite messy. Both boys had great fun making these, and although the kitchen was always in quite a mess by the time we'd finished, they were very good about tidying up afterwards. This is the most enjoyable part of the process for children. I'm not sure if it's the decorating or if it's eating the decorations that's more fun. I'm hoping we're going to have enough. As much fun as it is to make these, the really good part of it is eating them. Isn't it, girls? Mmm. Delicious. A tea party with mouse-shaped cupcakes. How could a young prince or princess possibly resist? Of course, chocolate desserts for grown-up royals have tended to be a little more sophisticated. Well, Paul, are you cooking mouse cupcakes? <laughs> no, but I'm doing... I'm going to add another S and we're going to do a mousse. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but what specifically are you going to do? We're going to do a chocolate bavoir basically a rich set mousse made in exactly the same way with the eggs and the cream giving it richness but you add gelatine to it so it's almost like a jelly kind of style mousse all right quite a classic recipe and a favorite of queen victoria's the base of the bavoir starts yep. with us making basically a custard so we've got cream and milk in this pan which yep. we're just going to bring up to a simmer yep here we've got egg yolks and sugar so we're just going to add these to this bowl three eggs so we just whisk our egg yolks and sugar together until they go pale. Now, this particular dish was served at one of Queen Victoria's garden parties. Her cook, Gabrielle Chumi, yeah. did it for the garden party on July the 11th, 1900. And it was obviously the attraction of the food at the garden party because the rest of it was, to be honest, pretty plain, particularly for... Victorian Edwardian times. Yeah. I mean, they've dressed it up as you chefs, oh, here we go. As you do, chefs do <laughs> with a lot of French. It says, les sandwich de boeuf, les sandwich de jambon. But the truth is, beef, and ham sandwiches. beef sandwiches, <laughs> ham sandwiches, chicken sandwiches, and tongue sandwiches. So by the time you've had those, pretty plain by the sound yeah. of it, you'd be aching for something really sophisticated if you'd turned up for a royal garden party at Buckingham Palace in 1900, I would have thought. So a lot rests on this. So if you'd just like to have a look at this here, Michael. Yep, yep, yep. All right, we've got our custard mix now. You'll see there I've got some beautiful 70% dark chocolate. So what the 70% means is 70% cocoa. Mm. All right? Mm, mm, mm. So now we've just cooked our custard. Very, lovely, in yeah? very yeah. intense flavour, that. Mm. We'll just add those in gently. Keep whisking. So you're melting it, and this is basically like kind of like making a ganache, you know, like when you see like chocolate truffles. Yeah. So we're now going to... Change our whisk. So what we do is, is we just keep folding that mix. Goodness, that's rich. It's lovely, absolutely lovely. And the, it, the trick is, don't skimp on the chocolate. No. You know, use great quality chocolate. I bet Gabriel Chumi didn't uh, skimp on the chocolate because Queen Victoria had a very, very sweet tooth, I think. Right, stage one. So we'll just pop that over here. And the idea is to let that cool. Yeah. All right? Because if you don't let that cool, you're then going to split the cream. We've whipped that, yeah. as you can see, yeah. like that, OK? So add in the cream to the mix. And again, more of that folding. My goodness, so you just... put together some calories in your day, haven't you? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right, look at that. It looks rich, doesn't it? It does. Right, over here, we've got a ring which in the bottom of there is a sablé biscuit. What, now, what, what does that mean? Sablé is like a cross between pastry and a biscuit. It's equal quantities of flour mm. and butter. Yeah. And then we sweetened it slightly with sugar. Yeah. Bake them in the oven, so they're very, very almost shortbread-like mm -hmm. kind of pastry mm. biscuit. But not too sweet, because there's an awful lot of no. sweetness in that. Now, in okay. we go. Actually, this oh, might have been Queen Victoria's last garden party, you know, because she died about six months after this was served at, uh, at, at her garden party. Really? Yeah, she was okay. 81, had a stroke. Now, basically, just going to run our mix off. Yeah, to make it really neat on the top. Yeah, just lovely and smooth. 
You're like a little sculptor, aren't you, really? It's a lot you don't know about me. Yeah, the, rod <laughs> the rodan of the kitchen. Yes. <laughs> now, if you could just take those to the fridge for me. Yep. And around in the fridge, you should find two more like that, but set. Okay. Setting time for that would be... Because you've got the chocolate and the cream and the eggs, not long, all right? So about an hour and you'll be about ready to go. About an hour and be set. Yeah, OK, but I'll bring the other ones back. Yeah, excellent. And they look lovely and crisp Gorgeous, and round. Aren't they? So I pop them on there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So these ones here we've unmoulded. Right. Next, the chocolate glaçage. Yeah. So we're going to take our liquids first. So water. Yep. Into the pan. Yep. Glaçage. Another glaçage. another chef's expression for glaze. Yeah. <laughs> just glaze. What? Just a kind of shiny. Just a shiny, shiny glaze. Cocoa powder. Yep. Golden caster sugar. Golden caster sugar being exactly like your, your ordinary caster sugar, but not as processed. So you've got that. It's got, it's got a bit of s very slight molasses flavour to it. And basically, just whisk it up to just below a boil. Mm. But what's going to turn it into a glaçage, Michael, is a gelatine. Now, the gelatin is in cold water, of course. Absolutely. I'm learning. And the reason it's in the cold water is because at, it's at like almost like a plastic. Yeah. Okay, it goes into the cold water and it blooms. It then becomes a jelly. We're almost there. But you see, it's like a really nice, thick sort of chocolate sauce. So here's our gelatine. Yeah. So now, with the gelatine being in there, when I pour this over our lovely bavoise, yeah. it's going to almost be like a shock. It's going to set yeah. as it's running down and give them a lovely, shiny coat. So, next, just going to leave that to cool slightly, yep. OK? Now, just very carefully. These very, very carefully uh, onto our rack. That's a professional job, that. All right. You don't want to muck it up at this stage, do you? No. They do look nice, though, they don't do, they? They do, don't they? They look machined, almost, yeah. don't they? So now we're going to go and nappe <laughs> our glaçage. You're going to nappe your glaçage? <laughs> <laughs> So, nappe in my glaçage means I'm spooning my shiny chocolate sauce and keep going. That's what the tray's for. Yeah. Now, and why is that not melting? Because it's the so cold. The original little cake. And because it's a thin layer, it's cooling it down yeah. really, really Instantly, quickly. Instantly, presumably. Instantly, yeah. OK. Now, next, just to make it really, really special. That's gold leaf. It's gold leaf. Good gracious. That's a bit of a waste, isn't it? This is Royal Recipes, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Queen Victoria, for her garden party, she had, she had the actual menu cards and invitations and things actually in gold with the royal coat of arms on it. But I bet everybody who went there kept it, you know. It's a nice aesthetic contrast, isn't it? The dark of the chocolate and the bright gold of the gold leaf. Gold leaf has no flavour other than it just makes it decadent. And really decadent. It's all about that great yeah. quality chocolate. Oh, it's, Simple. It's one of the very few things that you think it's just nice on its own. Yeah. Isn't it? You want to concentrate on it. There we go. Take a bit of the gold. Mmm. Do you know, in Victoria's time, the poor people would queue outside Buckingham Palace if they knew there was a garden party on. Mm. Because all the leftovers and everything were gathered together and given to the poor. Fantastic. Queen Victoria's Garden Party, Bavarois au Chocolat. <clears throat> Join us next time for more Royal Recipes.